Okay. Just uh, got to figure out how to pull this up here. Yeah, the We're good. All right. Well, welcome back. It's um, almost on time. 30, 30 more seconds. I think I'm getting this down. Uh, welcome back to the Facebook world that's out there as well. Um, this afternoon, uh, we've got a couple things going on, and the first one is working with uh, a gentleman that I have the option, uh, opportunity and, and honor to interview earlier, 2020, I think it was. I don't know if it was 20 or 20 or 21. Um, uh, and, and I quickly discovered that Yari is a, a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> That's, that's a nice way of putting it. Uh, he knows more about taps and about bugles than I think there's anybody that's currently walking the planet. Um, and so we re immediately reached out to him and said, hey, I want you to come out to Centennial Week. I'd like to be able to present this to anyone who's there in person and out, get it out on Facebook once again and give you the opportunity to, to, to tell the world about the buglers that had an impact during the unknown soldiers' burials from 1921, 1958, and 1984. And I think you're gonna see a little bit of that today. I'll let him talk about the wonderful program that he had on Sunday, um, which I was honored enough to be able to come to and speak. But if you've never heard the mass playing of taps by bugles and trumples, trumpets like uh, we did on that day, uh, it'll definitely bring a tear to your eye. It was, it was impressive how you did that, so if you might in your comments, find a way to talk about that. It would be good. I'm going to get out of the way now, uh, take a look at some of the things that he's brought up for show and tell, but uh, I'd like to turn it over to our good friend, Yari. Thanks, Gavin. All right. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. And as Gavin said, we had a program at Arlington National Cemetery this uh, past week. It was called Taps in Honored Glory. And it was a commemoration of the um, centennial of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and also looking at 100 years of taps at the tomb. Because taps is a, a call, of course, that is sounded. It's part of the ceremonies at the tomb. And it's, it's a very important, integral part to every ceremony that's at the tomb. But uh, today, we're going to talk about the bugler who first sounded taps at, um, at the tomb, and I'm gonna get this all straightened out here so I can work this, good. On November 11, 1921, an army bugler sounded the call of taps on the plaza of Mo uh, Memorial Amphitheater at Arlington National Cemetery, bringing to a close the ceremonies for the burial of the unknown soldier of World War I. The interment of an unknown soldier from the Great War was an idea started after the interments of unknowns in, in Great Britain and France in November 1920. After World War I ended, Great Britain and France each repatriated and buried one unknown soldier on Armistice Day, November 11, 1920. Great Britain buried its unknown warrior inside Westminster Abbey in London, and France buried its unknown soldier at the base of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. These unknowns would stand in for other, Brit other British and French service members who, whose remains could not be identified. The large and impressive ceremonies for the French and British unknowns led to a desire uh, to honor an American soldier in the same way. On December 21, 1920, Representative Hamilton Fish III of New York introduced House Resolution 426, which provided for the return to the United States of the remains of an unknown sol American soldier killed in France for, during World War I, and for the interment of his remains in a tomb to be built outside the newly constructed Memorial Amphitheater in Arlington National Cemetery. This is a, a copy of the resolution. And this is the east side of uh, the amphitheater, just around the dedication in 1920. Uh, of course, they were to rebuild it and uh, put the tomb there. Now, in spite of the delays brought on by the suggestions of alternate 
uh, locations for the burial spot and concerns about not being able to find an unknown and the change in administrations, Congress approved the resolution on March 4th, 1921. In the last hours of his presidency, Woodrow Wilson signed the House Resolution 67 into law. On November 11, the unknown soldier from World War I was interred at Arlington National Cemetery with great ceremony. The bugler who was chosen to sound taps at the ceremony was Frank Witchie, Headquarters Bugler, 3rd United States Cavalry Regiment. Witchie was born um, in, in uh, Kansas. We're not quite sure that where exactly he was born in Kansas because the records of this particular uh, uh, soldier shows Kansas City, uh, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, and another town in Kansas. But, and hopefully one day we're gonna be able to find uh, records, exactly maybe a birth certificate. Now, Witchie enlisted in the 3rd United States Cavalry in March uh, 1908. He was 16 at the time, but the Army allowed the recruitment of young buglers. The 3rd U.S. Cavalry was originally formed in 1846 as the Regiment of Mounted Riflemen, and the unit served in the Mexican War, and in 1861, the Regiment of Mounted Riflemen was renumbered the 3rd United States Cavalry. By the way, this is um, one of his um, records showing his promotions. He, he uh, enlisted as a musician and was playing in the band uh, then was promoted to band sergeant in 1918. Um, the unit also served in the Mexican War, as I mentioned, and they also served during the Indians War and the Spanish-American War and in the Philippines. And they were actually there until 1908 when they were ordered home and stationed in Texas. This is the coat, the regimental coat of arms of the 3rd Cavalry. Now, during those nine years after 1908, they were spent on the Mexican border patrolling um, and you know, running after Pancho Villa and stuff like that. And during World War I, yep, I thought I had one. Here's a picture actually of the third um, on the border down in Texas. During World War I, uh, they were um, uh, deployed to France and charged with the purchasing of horses, mules, and, and forage, the care, conditioning, and training of remounts before issue, and the distribution of those remounts to the American Expeditionary Force. One of the squadrons saw action during the war, and Witchie was with them for 23 months, and he was involved with one battle, a battle at Chateau Terry, where he was slightly wounded. After the war, the second squadron of the 3rd Cavalry was stationed at Fort Myer, Virginia. Because of its proximity to Washington and Arlington National Cemetery, the second squadron was frequently called upon to furnish honor guards and escorts for ceremonies and funeral escorts for the distinguished civilian officials and military personnel. It also became known as Pershing's Own because of these duties. Until 1941, the regiment provided the honor guard detail at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Witchie was the regimental bugler. He was assigned to headquarters troop, and he sounded calls on a regular basis uh, on garrison and also for ceremonies in Arlington. Witchie became friends with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Wainwright when, Rain when Wainwright was assigned to the 3rd Cavalry at Fort Myer. Witchie's wife, Margaret, recalled that Wainwright had given her husband a gray horse, which he rode in many parades on Pennsylvania Avenue. In July 1920, Witchie married Margaret Murphy of Mahanoy City, Pennsylvania. The marriage took place at the chapel at Fort Myer. She had been employed by the federal government. They were to have four children, one who died in infancy, uh, a daughter, Margaret, and two sons, Donald and um, Francis, who both served, one in the Navy and one in the Air Force. This is a picture of them on their wedding day. Frank is to the right, 
Margaret is down at the bottom, and the other two are the attendees at the uh, wedding. Witchy sounded taps at the internment of the unknown soldier on November 11, 1921, with President Harding presiding. It's hard to find photos of him there. This is an actual taken, this is a still taken from a video uh, or film as they were moving the casket uh, from the amphitheater over to the tomb, they went right by him. Um, and the, the large pictures of the ceremony taken from above, which he is far off to the right, just out of the camera's reach. But if you go to Arlington, they have a full photo of that, and you can actually see him holding his bugle, getting ready to play. Now, during the ceremony, um, oh, by the way, by the, although I cannot find uh, document, documentation to the effect, it was reported that Witchy was uh, picked by General Pershing to sound taps for the ceremony. This would not have been uh, something out of the ordinary for the general because he did pick the casket bearers, the body bearers, uh, for, the, for the unknown soldier. During the ceremony, Witchy sounded the call of attention three times starting an observance of two minutes of silence. And to conclude the ceremony, he sounded taps. Now, a unique uh, aspect of this ceremony was the use of the new loudspeakers installed at the Memorial Amphitheater, which enabled the voice of the president, uh, President Harding and others, plus the sound of Witchy's bugle to be heard by the thousands who were attending the burial service. Also, uh, radio carried the ceremony across the country, marking the first time the president's voice reached multitudes in New York, Chicago, and San Francisco. Frank Witchie would go on to sound taps for the funerals of President Woodrow Wilson and President Howard Taft, along with uh, Lieutenant General Miles, uh, Lieutenant General Young, uh, Major General Leonard Wood, and Colonel William Jennings Bryant. He also sounded taps for Calvin Coolidge Jr., the son of President Calvin Coolidge, who passed away from blood poisoning at the age of 16. In some newspaper articles, it stated that Witchy was the bugler who also sounded taps for uh, President Harding, but uh, according to official records, I cannot find exactly who did sound taps, although the Third Cavalry did support the President funeral with an escort to Union Station. After sounding taps, Witchy becomes somewhat of a celebrity. He is mentioned in numerous, I should say almost hundreds, of newspaper articles during the 1920s. Many articles refer to him as the most famous bugler of the War Department. During the 1920s and 30s, up to his retirement in 1938, which he sounded taps hundreds of times for funerals in Arlington and at services at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Bugling duty was the mission of the 3rd Cavalry until the United States Army Band, Pershing Zone, which was formed in 1922, gradually assumed ceremonial duties in Arlington. The 3rd Cavalry was to leave uh, Fort Myer altogether in 1942 to become a mechanized uh, unit in Georgia. Then, of course, in 1948, the 3rd United States Infantry was reactivated to assume ceremonial duties in Washington. There are many photos of uh, Witchy taken between 1921 and 1938. Uh, he was to perform countless ceremonies at the tomb. Here's a, a photo of him at the uh, USS Maine Memorial. He also wound up playing many ceremonies for the um, War Mothers of America. They would have him play on uh, special ceremonies uh, on Mother's Day and also ask him to play on Memorial Day in the afternoon. And then um, th they would also ask him to play on Armistice Day at the U.S. Uh, Capitol building on the east front where the steps are there's a porch that goes out and they would fly their special flag every day, or excuse me, not every day, but uh, for that day on November 11th, they had special permission from the Speaker of the House. And this actually was a tradition that kept going. I don't know if it's still done today, but I know it was done in the 1980s 
because I actually did that ceremony a couple times uh, at the Capitol on Veterans Day. Um, he also wound up being uh, in advertisements, you know, you know, buy this particular type of bugle because Frank Witchie uh, plays it. Um, this is a, you know, a keystone bugle, a fanfare bugle. One of the articles for Frank Witchie. Um, this is a very interesting one. This is taken from the Baltimore Sun. It was a big to-do that Frank Witchie was going to come up to Baltimore to play at the War Memorial Plaza. And uh, he was going to you know, be introduced by the governor and the mayor and everything. And then at the last minute, it turns out he couldn't make it. Uh, he had some other duties at Arlington, um, and so they had to write about that the next day. Of course, this all leads up to his retirement. He retires in 1938. He retired at the rank of technical sergeant in June 1938. One of his comrades in the 3rd Cavalry said that at the time of Witchie's retirement, that he was one of the best in blowing taps. Not many people were dry-eyed when he got through, said uh, the soldier. Another trooper remembered he could sound boots and saddles in such a way to, uh, to send even the greenest recruits off at a dead run. On his retirement orders of the day, it also included a supplement from Colonel Jonathan Wainwright. W Wainwright, who had served as a lieutenant colonel, then had left for a while and then came back to assume command of the third. In the, um, in the late 30s. And by the way, they became uh, good friends. Um, I have his orders promoting him to tech sergeants that, that are signed by Colonel Wainwright. And also at his retirement, Wainwright wrote a personal letter to uh, Witchie thanking him for his service and then gave him a, a signed photograph uh, that states to my good friend and you know, headquarters bugler and friend, Frank Witchie. But uh, Wayne Wright was to say of Witchie, Sergeant Witchie has proved himself a soldier typical of the finest traditions of the service. Throughout his 30 years, all in this regiment, his career has been marked by his unselfish devotion to duty. On June 30th, 1938, Frank Witchie appeared on the Rudy Valley radio show. And... Um, I've got this, and hopefully this is going to work. I've got it's, it, this lasts about six minutes. I got to tell you that uh, I heard read about the fact that he appeared on the Rudy Valley radio show, and of course, uh, we all know Rudy Valley. Of course, was this great. Uh, he was a saxophonist who turned uh, vocalist during the 1920s and 30s. Very quite pop popular crooner of the time, but he had a radio show that ran from 1929 to 39. And after reading that he had been on the show, um, I, I, I said, I gotta find the audio, gotta find the audio. So of course, what do we do? We go on Facebook. Every group has, you know, has a page, and there was an old time radio show, um, a Facebook group page. So I went and I asked the question, if anybody knew about uh, the Rudy Valley show that featured a bugler in the late 30s. And seriously, five minutes, somebody pops up and says, oh, you mean June 30th, 1938, uh, Frank Witchie on the Rudy Valley show. Yeah, I have the audio if you want it. So it's amazing what you can get. So this is, this is the show. It has the introduction of, um, of, of the program, a little bit of the music. You hear Rudy talking, and I've cut out so much, but it, then it goes to... Um, uh, the, the interview with um, Frank Witchie where he talks about, you know, what it was to be like in the Army, and then he actually plays the, some bugle calls. So, let's see. My fingers crossed. The Royal Desserts Hour, directed by Rudy Valley. This is Rudy Valley and Company. The people of the hour tonight include five of the principal members of the cast of Broadway's newest operetta hit, The Two Bouquets. 
They will be introduced by the celebrated playwright, Mark Connolly. Betty Lou Barry, and as a special patriotic holiday feature, the Army's most famous bugler, Staff Sergeant Frank Witchie, 3rd United States Cavalry, retired. Sergeant Witchie, sir, reporting for microphone detail. At ease, Sergeant. My compliments on your handsome appearance. You must have been very young when you enlisted. I was you hardly look old enough to be retired. I was 16 when I enlisted, Mr. Valley. I thought that 18 was the minimum enlistment age. It was, but the recruiting officer didn't ask for my birth certificate. I see. Your army career must have included service in France, yes, Sergeant. Sir. It did. The 3rd Cavalry spent 23 months overseas. Some of us were at Chateau Ferry and a number of other uncomfortable spots. Were you wounded? Slightly, yes. Who won the war, Sergeant? The Marines, of course. Everybody knows that. <laughs> do I detect a note of sarcasm in the Sergeant's voice? Yes, sir, you do. Not that anybody wants to take away from what the Marines did. They deserve all the glory they get. But there were a few dismounted horse soldiers around there, too. You ought to know, Sergeant. I understand that modern warfare finds little use for mounted troops. That's right. Machine gun fire, turtle, thing, two horses. Yes, it's hardly civilized to treat horses that way. Is the 3rd Cavalry mechanized nowadays? Partly, yes. I imagine you old-time cavalrymen don't uh, particularly care for mechanization. That's right. And you can hardly blame us for preferring a fine horse to a stinking gasoline engine. <laughs> Do you think that cavalry will be entirely supplanted by mechanized troops? No. Horses will always be useful. They don't run out of gas. Sergeant, our purpose in bringing you up from Fort Myer was largely mu musical. I think a lot of former soldiers would like to hear a few bugle calls without the necessity of doing anything about the implied command. Let's run through part of a day in the life of a bugler. Might we have the first call, please? That's the one that wakes you up. And as a one-time, somewhat less than able seaman, I know you never want to get up. But then you hear this. And out we roll, cursing feebly. By the way, Sergeant, who does wake up the bugler? The corporal of the guard on the night's last guard release. May all his children suffer from insomnia. <laughs> well, the next call is much more welcome. <laughs> soupy, 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 without a single bean. Coffee, 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 the worst you've ever seen. And next we hear... <laughs> the orders for the day. We'll suppose include one of those movie tone news cavalry drills we see so often, usually in the snow at Fort Ethan Allen. The bugler blows. <laughs> boots and saddle. And then, with the cameraman carefully placed in a pit so that he can catch the horses thundering overhead, we hear attack. But sometimes it isn't for the news camera. Sometimes it's real, desperately real. And later the bugler plays another call for men who cannot hear the note. Let us hope it never need be real again. But let us remember too why so many men have died. I recall a line from a play once performed in this program, Maxwell Anderson's Valley Forge. In the play, the author has George Washington say, this liberty will look easy by and by when men no longer die to get it. In these days when the idea and value of human liberty is denied with a sneer in so many lands, it is well to remember that liberty is not an easy thing to have and hold. For the men who die to get it in the quiet belief that they did not die in vain.
Thank you, Sergeant Witchy. That's pretty neat, isn't it, to hear that? By the way, here's the um, copy of the original script from it. Frank Witchy signed a contract, uh, and he got a whole $100 for his appearance on the show, which actually, 1938 was uh, pretty good. <laughs> Here's the article that talks about him being on the radio. And a shot of him, um, if you've ever been to Arlington National Cemetery, you know that there are special sections throughout the cemetery. There's one uh, for nurses, uh, one for doctors, and of course there's one for chaplains, Chaplain's Hill, uh, which he sounded uh, taps for the dedication of the Chaplain's Monument. After his retirement, uh, the Witchy stayed in the Arlington area, the first living on Barton Street and then later North Oak Street. Uh, he worked as a guard at the U.S. State Department, um, which is interesting to note that um, he was promoted to technical sergeant in May of 1937 and then retired the next year. He was hoping to retire at the rank of Master Sergeant. I think back in those days, when you retired after with 30 years, you could retire at the next rank above. Uh, but the, the rules had changed several months before his retirement, so he was only able to retire at the Tech Sergeant rank. He says it was the, the worst, you know, the only break you know, he ever got while he was in the Army. Um, but it was the difference. Had he been able to retire as a Master, he would have made a hundred, uh, made $135 a month. Uh, retiring as a tech, he made $94, which is probably why he worked as a guard. Um, and by the way, um, is this the one? Yeah, this, this, this is very interesting. During World War II, when he filled this out, he was 52 years old, um, the, the, the government was requiring all men of certain ages to fill out, I guess, for, for enlistment back in the Army. But he had just, you know, completed 30 years. My goodness. So, but um, in 19, in September 1945, he entered Walter Reed Hospital, and unfortunately passed away from heart disease. Um, he was uh, he passed away on September 30th, 1945. On October 4th, as his uh, obituary, um, he was buried with full military honors on October 4th, 1945. With Ar at Arlington National Cemetery. He's buried in Section 19. Technical Sergeant John Tunney of uh, Pittsburgh sounded taps for him. This is his, uh, the internment card, marking his, his information that would wind up, of course, on his headstone. And we stopped by uh, there on Sunday to lay flowers. We had the uh, family. His grandchildren um, are, live in the area, and they, they've been very kind to give me uh, information about Frank, provide me with uh, some artifacts, um, and of course I have been scouring eBay and uh, the Library of Congress for photographs, which you're more than welcome to, to check out when we finish. Um, another nice uh, image of the, his headstone with my bugle. Now the bugle used by Sergeant Witchy was one that was originally issued to him by the, ar uh, by the Army. It's, an, uh, it's the model 1892 field trumpet in the Kia G. It was made by Rifle and H Hostel of uh, Chicago and it's marked USQMC, United States Quartermaster Corps, on the bell along with the manufacturer's name at the top, uh, just marked R and H Chicago. This company, by the way, uh, was a silversmith uh, business. Um, and between 1917 and 1918, they received contracts from the government to produce bugles, uh, not only large ones, but also small ones. Another shot of the on the other side. The day after he sounded taps for the unknown soldier, he purchased the bugle from the quartermaster of the department for two dollars and fifty cents, and had the instrument gold plated, and had the following 
engraved on the bell. It says, taps sounded over the body of unknown soldier at Arlington National Cemetery, November 11, 1921, by Staff Sergeant Frank Witchie of Headquarters Troop, 3rd U.S. Cavalry, Fort Myer, heard through amplifier at New York and San Francisco. And then he was also then to add on um, other um, in ceremonies in which it was used uh, for General Miles and for Williams Jennings Bryant. In 1927, a collector offered $1,500 for the bugle, but he refused to sell it. Um, after Witchie's death, the bugle went missing. In 1961, the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment, which was now stationed at Fort George G. Meade near Washington, began searching for the bugle uh, for which they wanted for inclusion in their museum. An article appeared in the Baltimore Sun. So they really were going looking for it. <laughs> the tabard, a tabard is also known as a bugle banner. It's, it's held from a, a, a trumpet or a banner, or a trumpet or a bugle, and it's usually, it's a, it's a piece of silk and tabards were authorized by the War Department in 1921. And what they are, basically, it's a rectangular piece of banner of silk or cloth hanging from the bugle or trumpet. And the design depends on a, a regiment. Um, if one is regiment, has a coat of arms, they would put that on there for them. And now, which he used several of them during his time. We also see him with a tabard that has the big number three on it, just like he has on his shoulder, uh, the patch. In late summer of 1961, they located the bugle in the possession of a Mr. Melvin White, a tax consultant in Alexandria, Virginia, who said which he had sold him the bugle. The bugle was presented to Colonel Donald Coles, the commander of the 3rd Armored Regiment, and placed in the museum and has been in the regi Regimental Museum ever since, but ha is now currently at Arlington National Cemetery in the display room at the tomb. So if you get a chance to go there within the next couple uh, months, you'll get to see it and you'll get to see uh, the silk tabard also. I have another one of his tabards here that he used. Um, nobody knows exactly which one was the original. I'd like to say mine is, but probably the one they have there on display is. Um, although this tabard that they is, the one they presented is not the one that's in the museum or being displayed. So uh, they may have given two, we're not sure. But anyway, if you get a chance to go over to Arlington and see it, it's a, it's a pretty looking horn. Um, Staff Sergeant Frank Witchie began a 100 year tradition of sounding taps at the tomb. To this day, taps is heard at the tomb performed by buglers from the premier bands of Washington, D.C. Now, I was honored to perform this task on a few occasions. Of my time with the United States Air Force Band, these were the most memorable and honored duty that I was tasked with. In 1958, the unknown soldier from World War I um, was joined by unknowns from World War II and the Korean conflict. They were buried on the plaza of, on Memorial Day, 1958. Sergeant First Class George Myers of the U.S. Army Band sounded taps, and you can see him on the far right uh, sounding the call. On May 30th, 1984, an unknown from the Vietnam War was buried on the plaza. The bugler who sounded taps was Sergeant Major Patrick Mastrolio of the U.S. Army Band. Both Myers and Mastrolio are buried in Arlington National Cemetery in Section 34 near the grave of General John Blackjack Pershing. And I might add that this section in 34 is unofficially reserved for members of the United States Army Band. There are many band members who are buried there, including the bugler who sounded taps for John F. Kennedy. The tomb of the unknown soldier, of course, is guarded by soldiers of the 3rd United States Infantry Regiment, the old guard stationed at Fort Myer. Since assuming the task of, of, of guarding the tomb in 1948, these tomb guards have kept constant vigil 
at the tomb every hour of the day, every day of the year. And the tomb has not been left unguarded since 1937. Now, it's interesting to know that when the Third Cavalry started guarding the tomb, they, along with the 12th U.S. Infantry Regiment, who were both stationed at Fort Myer, they began the mission of guarding the tomb in 1926, replacing a civilian watchman who had been posted there during the day uh, since, the, since November 1925. Now, incredible as it seems, there was no military guard in the early years of the, t of the tomb's existence due to the resistance of the, of the higher-ups to provide soldiers for this duty. Now, during the uh, years that the 3rd Cavalry guarded the tomb, their uniform was marked by the wearing of spare spurs on their boots. It's hard to make out, but they, he is wearing spurs. In 1932, the original tomb, of course, was topped off with a large marble sarcophagus, and originally set as a daylight duty, the guard was extended to 24 hours on July 2nd, 1937, and it's been guarded there ever since. Now, the oh, always an impressive sight. The bugle call of taps has had a long association with Arlington National Cemetery. Today it is sounded at the many interments at Arlington as well as the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier when a wreath is presented in honor of the unknowns by the many uh, military, veteran, civic, fraternal, school, and other organizations that travel to Washington to pay homage. It is also sounded at memorial services and ceremonies held in the uh, cemetery. It's difficult to visit Arlington and not hear the 24 notes of the call sounded by a military bugler from one of the four bands in Washington. Um, taps originated during the American Civil War, first replacing the uh, regulation call of extinguished lights in 1862, and then later gaining a, an association with military funerals by the end of the war. The call was usually sounded after three volleys of rifles were fired. This practice was performed at military funerals following the Civil War and then finally put into regulation in 1891. The first burials at Arlington took place in 1864, but no one knows for sure exactly when taps first was sounded at a graveside ceremony. But certainly by the, 19, uh, by the 1870s, taps was uh, part of the military ritual at funerals and gradually became part of the memorial services. The first Memorial Day service was held at Arlington May 30th, 1868. However, going through the program that day and reading newspaper articles, there is no record of taps being sounded at that first uh, ceremony. But as years went on, taps became an important part of the annual program. Um, TAPS is the only call that has a dual purpose. It is our national song of farewell as designated by Congress it sounded, and is sounded at military funerals and memorial services. And it's still used as its original intent, as the lights out call in the evening. Today, TAPS is usually sounded or played on a recording on every United States military base around the world to close out the evening. The call can be heard at Arlington in the evening at 11 o'clock as the notes drift over the headstones of military personnel who once went to sleep with the bugle sound in their ears. Military band or military funerals in Arlington are supported by the bands in Washington. Bands are used in full honor funerals to lead the, a procession through Arlington that includes a military commander, escort troops, casket bearers, chaplains, and a horse-drawn caisson. The bands play on the march with a muffled drum cadence and perform appropriate hymns as the flag-draped casket is moved to the grave and as the flag is being follow, uh, folded following taps. Taps is sounded by a bandsman who usually steps out of formation to sound the call. An important duty for military bands are the ceremonies held at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. The tomb is the domain of the U.S. Army. Being the senior service, it is charged with the responsibility of guarding the unknown soldiers and providing buglers to sound taps at ceremonies held on the plaza. 
Buglers are selected from the United States, from members of the United States Army Band. These buglers sound taps at the many wreath ceremonies held daily. Usually done in two shifts, morning and afternoon, they report to the sergeant of the guard or the relief commander under the memorial amphitheater. The tomb guards have an area located in the basement of the memorial amphitheater display room where they train and prepare for their daily missions. It is here where the bugler will, will also prepare for a ceremony on the plaza. Many buglers bring their band jacket. The U.S. Army Band wears a unique eight-button frock adorned with special insignia and chevrons and a scarlet cap. They usually bring it on a hanger in a plastic travel bag and also bring the essentials along for, that they need for the day. A lint brush, a polishing cloth for the bugle, uh, and a, a practice mute for warming up. The tomb guard has impeccable standards and the buglers strive to make sure that they are presentable to the public when they follow the sentinel onto the plaza for a wreath ceremony. The army buglers at the tomb are addressed as Sergeant B and are respected by the tomb guard for what they bring to the mission in terms of their musical skill. There is a mutual respect and admiration between tomb guards and Sergeant B. In addition to sounding taps, the buglers also assist with uh, moving the wreath to be presented at ceremonies. It is a duty not taken lightly. Sounding taps may be interpreted as a pretty easy chore considering it, that it's a short call. But as the late trumpet collector and author Roy Hampley wrote, quote, Taps is a simple tune, but it is not easy to play with the appropriate combination of beauty, emotion, and serenity demanded by these occasions. Each bugler develops his or her style within the limits defined by military customs and good taste. A not so obvious fact, however, is that buglers must render this solemn symbol of mourning under the most difficult circumstances which might include hot or cold weather, rain, snow, etc. There is no room for error, regardless of the, the demands, unquote. And I've always considered uh, sounding taps uh, at the tomb as the military musician's equivalent of playing Carnegie Hall. It's the place where the most pressure of performance is placed. Sounding of taps at the tomb is an honor that's only open to military musicians and specifically to those uh, who are members of one of the premier barons in Washington. In Memorial Day 1933, President Roosevelt began the formal wreath laying ceremony, uh, began, he began a formal wreath laying ceremony that has continued to this day. President Roosevelt also traveled there on Armistice Day, which of course became um, Veterans Day to deliver addresses and lay a wreath. And when the Third United States Infantry was reactivated in 1948, they assumed the ceremonial duties as the escort to the president, as well as providing soldiers for military funerals and establishing the guard at the tomb. The United States Band, Army Band, has been providing buglers for the services at the tomb and a decision was made to continue the use of valveless bugles. So when you go to a ceremony at the tomb, you will see a bugler uh, a bu using a real bugle, not a trumpet uh, at these ceremonies. And it's, it's, it's because it is a, a, a tradition. Uh, the bugle has been the traditional signal instrument in the United States Army since the Revolutionary War. And it has gone through many several uh, design changes before settling on the one used today. Oh, by the way, this is a large bugle that th this fella is using, one that we borrowed from the French after World War I. Um, here's uh, the smaller type of bugle. This is uh, down in the crypt uh, for a ceremony for uh, U.S. airmen who were killed in Yugoslavia in 1947. Uh, the bugler is George Myers. And this is a close-up of the bugle that's made, uh, that's used by the Army Band today. They were specially made by Vincent Bach, who was a, a well-known instrument maker, maker of trumpets and trombones. 
Um, he was approached in the late 40s by members of the Army Band to make a specific horn for use at Arlington, and they've been using them ever since. Although I will point out and mention that uh, some bugles, buglers are using a new model type of bugle right now, now made by a fellow by the name of David Monet. It's a much bigger type of instrument, almost looks like the old French style. By the 1970s, by the way, um, at, there was a time when they had outside people could play on the, on the tomb. There are many, many photographs in the 40s and 50s where uh, fraternal organizations, the American Legion, uh, Boy Scouts would actually do ceremonies and they would bring their own bugler. But by the 1970s, no more outside performers were allowed to sound taps on the tomb. To be sure, there have been rare occasions, extremely rare, where uh, it's, they've allowed an outside bugler to sound taps at a military funeral at Arlington. As the number of wreath ceremonies increased in the 60s and 70s, um, they posted a bugler to uh, be at the tomb every single day to sound the call. And uh, as any tomb guard will tell you, it gets quite busy during the summer months. To the general public, hearing taps sounded on the plaza in front of the Memorial uh, Amphitheater is a memorable and moving experience. Most have no idea of the hard work, the years of musical training and preparation that goes into the one minute of music performed at the tomb. Sergeant First Class Drew Fremder of the Army Band stated, Sounding taps is playing in appreciation of those who have given their last breath in service to our nation and the freedoms we protect. For those who sacrificed more than ever I can in my career. A bugler plays no longer for appreciation, but in appreciation for the, those of who made the ultimate sacrifice. This humbling realization is something I carry with me to this day. Putting on the uniform to serve my country as a musician is an honor. It, if it is my purpose as a musician in this world, I'm honored to serve in appreciation of true heroes. And we have a saying that um, for 60 seconds, a bugler has the most important job in the military. Past Sunday, we, as we mentioned, we held a special ceremony at Arlington to commemorate, you know, taps in honored glory, a centennial of taps being sounded at the tomb, and we went to the graves uh, of the buglers and laid wreaths at their, uh, at their graves and, and paid homage to them, and also, of course, we, we played, uh, paid homage to the unknown soldier. We had the grandchildren of Frank Witchie lay a special wreath uh, that afternoon uh, in honor of the unknown soldier. And with that, I say thank you. Here's my two websites, tapsbugler.com, tapsforveterans.org, and me when I was good looking back in the old, 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 old days. <laughs> so questions? Sir, yes? Wow, the band I think has like uh, like 25 trumpet players. They have a, each band has a, a, a large number of trumpet players. For example, like in the uh, Air Force band, we have the concert band, we have the ceremonial brass, we have the airmen of note. So that's that's a lot of trumpet players to draw from. The ceremonial brass, the group that I was in, uh, one of our duties was to train those other buglers. You know, you have a jazz player who comes in, you have to teach him. Well, you, you're a jazz player, yes. But an important duty you have is to sound taps at Arlington. And I have to tell you, I remember I took one out, and he was terrified. Uh, just absolutely terrified. I said, I don't understand. You, you play great jazz solos in front of thousands of people. He says, this is a completely different uh, thing to do. So he, he got it, and he, he, he understood. And, and when he played taps, it was, it was marvelous. So any other questions? Yes? Oh, OK. A 
That's a great question. Yes, TAPS has been around a long time. There is no real history of museum uh, of, of TAPS. However, tapsbugler.com has extensive articles on the history of TAPS, uh, bugles that have been used for throughout our, our throughout the time of the military. There are articles about various buglers who have sounded the call. Um, and some, some fun articles too, uh, not just all serious, but you know, some of these buglers were characters. Like uh, for example, there was a, 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 non a civilian who for 36 years would play Reveille every morning in his little hometown. He built a little uh, post and every morning at six o'clock for 36 years <laughs> would, would play taps. And then of course we had a retired army sergeant in Baltimore who wound up playing at the Orioles games during the 1960s and 70s after he retired. And I remember as a kid going to Baltimore Orioles games and hearing a bugle player there. So I did some research about that, uh, that guy. But the answer to the question, no real brick and mortar museum, uh, but if you go to tapsbugler.com, you can see lots of photos, get lots of information, and the best thing is you can always send an email with a question and I'm happy to answer. Okay, thank you. And before we get to the next one, I'm going to take the stuff over here. I, I do have boots, the boots that Frank wore, one of his bugles that, uh, that came from his family, and a lot of photos and a tabard. So you can take a look at those. He's not going to oh. get away that easy. Uh, I'd like to answer your question real quickly because I've been having a good discussion between the Society and the United States Army Band, Pershing Zone, and, the, and Sergeant B. Um, they, they have one bugler that is assigned to the tomb per day. That's their sole mission. And then the remaining buglers, as you already mentioned, have additional duties within the cemetery. And those Sergeant Bs will rotate, but they're actually a very small core of cadre of buglers. Um, as, as Yari can attest to, and as mentioned, that 24-note bugle call, when put on the plaza of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, makes it even harder to play for these guys, which is amazing. You think they'd be able to just crush it because they do it every time and they do it flawlessly, but uh, there, there's a lot of pressure that those buglers go through on a daily basis. Because of YouTube. No, it's not because <laughs> of us. That's because of us. I've already presented Yari with a coin, but I'd like to, again, thank you for the opportunity to come down here and educate us on the bugles, especially during the centennial, and highlight those buglers that played such a key role in each one of the Unknown Soldiers' burial, because that is, is important. We talked about this on Sunday, how they, the, the, the general public may forget the families may forget what is said at the funeral, but they will never forget the sound of taps at a funeral, and it's all because of people like yourself. So thank you so much for educating us. It's my honor. Uh, and please come up here and take a look at all this. we got a little bit of time, so he doesn't have to move it too far, but take a look at some of the photos. Uh, admire the bugle, the boots, which are really impressive, actually, for, for those of us that like good leather and things like that. But thank you, Yari. You will. Totally welcome. appreciate it. Um, We'll keep this on for just a little bit more, but uh, we do have one more presentation uh, here in the afternoon. I believe it starts at about 3 o'clock, and that will be Jeff Gottesfeld coming in and talking about his children's book, which will be very interesting. So those of you out there in Facebook world or online, uh, please take a break, come back, and join us, and then we'll, uh, we'll do this again. So thank you for taking the opportunity to come down out of your day, spend it with us, and, and learn some unique history. Thank you.